Welcome to a new class in PEP's online course on Policy Impact Analysis. We will now introduce a series of topics relevant to the implementation of randomised control trials in practice. We will begin this class by taking a look at a real-life RCT project timeline. Next, we will go through the key steps involved in setting up a successful evaluation. We will then go on to review the most common design and implementation issues that researchers deal with in practice. In particular, we will take a closer look at a series of alternative techniques for randomization in small samples. And to conclude, we will present a set of practical recommendations. As we have seen in previous lessons, randomized control trials are the gold standard for impact evaluation studies. Through the random assignment of units to treatment and control groups, RCTs ensure that groups are comparable and that the causal impact of the programme will be identified. This requires highly controlled conditions, and this is why RCTs are often complex, multi-stage processes that require intensive planning and monitoring to ensure that everything works. RCT timelines can vary due to differences in the type of intervention being studied and the availability of previous data. We will now present an ideal timeline for an RCT study. The first step is to define a theory of change that explains exactly how the intervention will affect outcomes and the specific question that the evaluation is set to answer. The second step is generally the experiment design, that is, defining what the treatment or treatments will be. Once the experiment has been designed, the next step is running power calculations to select an appropriate sample size. We have gone through the details of power calculations earlier in this course. After defining the sample size, it's time for baseline data collection. This is the gathering of information from experimental units before the treatment is assigned. This information will serve as a benchmark to compare post-intervention results. The next step is to randomly assign units to treatment and control groups. After the assignment, the program is rolled out. After the intervention has taken place, it is time for follow-up data collection. This must happen after enough time has gone by in order to observe the effects of the intervention. Finally, Data is analysed and the results are reported and disseminated. It is important to note that timelines for experimental studies can vary considerably. For example, in some studies, baseline data is available before the intervention is designed because data was collected for other purposes. In other cases, baseline data is not collected at all and all evidence is reported on the difference between treatment and control groups. Finally, some interventions require multiple rounds of follow-ups to test how the effect of the intervention changes as time goes by. Setting up a successful impact evaluation. The cornerstone of a successful impact evaluation is its theory of change. A theory of change is a detailed description of how an intervention is supposed to deliver the desired results. It describes the causal logic of how and why the intervention will work as intended. It lays out the conditions and assumptions needed for the change to take place. The second step to a successful study is to propose a clear evaluation question. The basic impact evaluation question is, what is the impact of the programme on an outcome of interest? This question must be based on theory. It must also be structured as a testable hypothesis that can be answered with data. Finally, evaluation questions must be accompanied by a selection of specific outcome measures that would be used to assess results and decide whether or not the programme was successful. These outcomes are also referenced in the power calculations used to determine the sample sizes, as we have seen in previous lessons. The next step is to choose an evaluation design. A full specification of an experimental design can be summarized in three key elements. The first is an exact definition of treatment arms. 
you must describe in detail exactly what each of the interventions will consist. The second element is the level at which the treatment will be randomised, which may not necessarily be the level of the individual. The third element refers to the proportion of the sample assigned to control and treatment groups and the total sample size. As we have seen in the previous lesson, these are determined through power and sample size calculation exercises. Finally, it is crucial to make sure that the experiment is ethical. The question of whether experimental evaluations are themselves ethical has been raised many times. One way to think about it is to consider the ethics of investing substantial public resources in programmes whose effectiveness is unknown. From this standpoint, the lack of evaluation can itself be seen as unethical. An experiment design must always respect the first principle of evaluation ethics, which is to do no harm. This implies that groups should not be excluded from an intervention that is known to be beneficial solely for the purpose of conducting an evaluation. In practice, there are three main ethical considerations that must be taken into account. The rules used to assign programme benefits should be fair, equitable and transparent. Random assignment fulfils these requirements in contexts where limited financial resources make it impossible to reach all beneficiaries. The methods by which human subjects are studied should preserve welfare, privacy and be consented to by participants. The documentation of research plans, data and results should be transparent. A good way to enforce this ethical standard is to promote trial registration. It is the responsibility of the principal investigators to safeguard the rights and welfare of human subjects involved in the experiment and to obtain freely given and informed consent from participants. Ethics committees and ethics review boards are in charge of assessing the balance between risk and potential benefits involved in evaluations and deciding whether they are acceptable or not. Ethical clearance from an independent or in-house institution is a prerequisite for PEP as well as for most donors and universities. Once the study is set up, it is time to tackle a series of practical design and implementation issues. One of the most important issues is the level at which the treatment is randomised. As we have seen in previous lessons, the assignment to treatment can be randomised at the level of the individual, the family, the village or the district and so on. For example, students in an educational intervention can be randomised at the individual level or they can be randomised at the class level. Designs where treatment is randomised at a level higher than the individual are called cluster-based randomised control trials. The level of randomisation has strong practical implications. For instance, randomisation at higher levels is recommended in settings where spillover effects or externalities from the treatment can be expected. For example, in a deworming intervention among children randomised at the individual level, the comparison group will also indirectly benefit from the treatment, reducing the difference between the outcomes of treatment and controlled children. Randomising the intervention at the village level and targeting villages which are relatively far apart from each other, for example, will help reduce the bias in results due to spillovers. In some cases, randomization at the individual level can help avoid implementation difficulties. For example, when testing the effects of a conditional cash transfer, subjects selected into the control group might resent being excluded from the benefits. In such cases, randomizing the intervention at a higher level, such as villages or districts that are far apart, will prove a more sensible option. Finally, it is important to remember that cluster-based designs have an impact on project costs. 
Randomizing at the cluster level in settings where clusters are large will mean larger total sample sizes and generally higher costs. Once we have decided the level at which we will carry out the treatment assignment, it is time to tackle the issue of randomization. Random allocation of units to treatment is the core feature of an RCT design. Randomization ensures that the allocation of treatment is left purely to chance and is not systematically biased by deliberate selection of individuals or institutions. Randomization thus ensures that the treatment and control samples are, in expectation, similar on average both in terms of observed and unobserved characteristics. This is called achieving balance between the groups. The first question we face when dealing with balance is deciding which variables to balance. First of all, it is important to note that achieving perfect balance across all covariates is impossible and unnecessary. Balance is only required for variables that will be strongly correlated with the outcome of interest according to economic theory. Good candidates for variables to balance are the baseline value of the outcome of interest, variables desired for subgroup analysis, and geographic region dummies since treatment implementation and shocks are likely to vary by region. As we said before, randomization ensures that treatment and control samples are similar on average in expectation. In expectation means that characteristics among groups will be balanced among many draws of the allocation to treatment and control. Imagine we are randomizing pupils into treatment and control groups for an educational intervention. We decide to carry out a single random draw, hoping that the groups will be balanced in terms of their pre-treatment math scores. We know that a random draw allows us to expect a zero difference on average in the mean scores between groups. However, in any particular random allocation, the two groups can differ. The probability that such differences are large falls with sample size. Especially in small samples, if we randomize by running a single random draw, it is not unlikely for us to find an unbalanced sample, such as the pink draw on the graph. In fact, with k independent covariates, the chance of at least one covariate showing a significant difference between treatment and control groups at significance level alpha is given by the formula below. For just 10 covariates when alpha equals 5%, this probability is 40%. This is why we should only aim to balance covariates that are closely related to the outcome variable. Attempting to balance all covariates is bound to fail. So now we know that a single random draw is unable to achieve perfect balance across all variables in small samples. But what happens if our single random draw is unbalanced on important covariates? Should we just keep the unbalanced sample and hope for the best? Or is there anything else we could try? In practice, there are several alternative ways of randomly allocating units to treatment. The four most widely adopted practices are stratification or blocking, pairwise matching, and two versions of what are known as re-randomization methods. They are the big stick method and the min-max-t-stat method. These techniques have been shown to improve efficiency, power, and protection against type 1 errors, especially in small samples when compared to a single random draw. Researchers working with small-scale experiments can benefit greatly by considering these alternatives. Let's start with stratification. The standard approach to avoiding imbalance on a few key variables is stratification or blocking. It was originally proposed by R.A. Fisher in 1935. In this approach, first units are classified into strata or groups usually defined by one or two baseline characteristics. 
Then, units are randomly assigned to treatment and control within strata. The following is an example of a single random draw allocation versus stratification based on gender. In a simple random draw, each unit in the sample is allocated to either the treatment or control group on an individual basis through a coin toss or random number generator. For stratification by gender, the sample is first divided into men and women. Then, within each gender group, the units are randomly allocated to either the treatment or control group. Stratification must be acknowledged in the regression stage. This is done by including dummy variables indicating the strata to which an observation belongs. For our gender example, the equation would be the following, where S is a dummy that equals 1 if the subject is female and 0 if male. On average, it is overly conservative to not include the controls for stratum during analysis. This means that standard errors are too big and small effects will not be detected. However, sometimes the opposite can happen. Not including stratum dummies can reduce standard errors, potentially leading to find significant effects that are no longer significant when stratification is controlled for. Hence, best practice is to always include controls to avoid cherry picking significant results. The choice of variables for stratification is not trivial. Strata should be formed by a small number of variables strongly correlated to the outcome and or variables that define relevant subgroups for analysis. The main advantage of stratification versus a single random draw in a small sample is that it improves power. For a given level of power, stratification requires a smaller sample size. However, the method presents some disadvantages. Balance can be improved for only a limited number of variables, two to three. Even on selected variables, balance will not be perfect due to missing observations or odd numbers of units in strata. Stratifying on irrelevant variables reduces power due to the loss of degrees of freedom, especially in small samples. Pairwise matching. In pairwise matching, pairs of units are formed to minimize the Mahalanobis distance between the values of all the selected covariates within pairs. As always, only covariates that are closely correlated to the outcome of interest should be included. This minimization is carried out using an algorithm. The algorithm produces pairs of units which are as similar as possible considering all covariate dimensions at the same time. Then, one unit in each pair is randomly assigned to the treatment and the other to the control. This method introduces a series of advantages versus a single random draw in small samples. Most importantly, it improves power. For a given level of power, sample size requirements are smaller. Balance is achieved in a greater number of covariates than stratification. If a unit drops out of the study or suffers interference, its pair unit can also be dropped from the study. The set of remaining pairs will still be balanced. However, it also presents some disadvantages. If a unit drops out at random and its pair has to be dropped remedially, the sample size is reduced, affecting power. This does not happen in simple randomization. Dropping the paired unit will only yield a consistent estimate of the average treatment effect when the dropout is unrelated to the size of effect. If the dropout is related to the size of the treatment effect, then we can only identify the average treatment effect for the subsample of units that remain in the sample when the treatment is randomly offered. Just like stratification, pairwise matching must always be acknowledged at the analysis stage. This is done by including dummy variables indicating the pair to which each unit in the study belongs, as in the equation below. Again, 
on average, it is overly conservative to not include the control for pairs, but the omission can also be anti-conservative. Best practice is to always include controls. Re-randomization consists in carrying out many replications of a single random draw allocation and then using a statistical threshold or ad hoc procedure to choose the allocation that shows the best balance on a set of observable variables. We will cover two main methods of re-randomization, big stick and min-max t-stat. The big stick re-randomization method was proposed by Suarez and Wu in 1985. This method requires a redraw if a draw shows at least one variable for which the difference in means between treatment and control is significant. The first step is simply to run a single random draw allocation. Then run a test for the difference in means for each of the important covariates to see if any of them show a significant difference at the 5 or 10% levels. If there is no significant difference, the allocation is deemed good enough and the process ends there. If there are any significant differences, a new draw is made and the process is repeated until a balanced allocation comes up by chance. Minimum Maximum T-Stat this method entails running 1,000 draws of the treatment control allocation and then selecting the draw with the minimum degree of unbalance across important covariates. To carry out this exercise, the first step is to run a single random draw to assign units to treatment. The second step is to run a regression among each of the important covariates at the baseline and the treatment dummy, saving the t-stat for its coefficient. Afterwards, the highest t-stat score among all covariates is selected. The higher the t-stat, the higher the likelihood that the covariate is unbalanced. So this is the greatest unbalance present in that draw. Now repeat this sequence a thousand times. Finally, we choose the draw showing the minimum t-stat among all draws. This is the minimum maximum t-stat, or in other words, the draw whose worst unbalance is the least unbalanced among all draws. These methods present a series of advantages versus a single random draw in small samples. First, power is improved. For a given level of power, this means a smaller sample size is required. Balance is achieved in a greater number of covariates than stratification. Re-randomization provides a compromise solution preventing extreme imbalance on many variables without forcing close balance on each. Finally, it allows for approximate balance in the presence of multiple treatment groups of unequal sizes. The main disadvantage is that there is no consensus on how to properly control for re-randomization during inference. Now we'll look at an example illustrating the performance of alternative randomization techniques in small samples using the Mexican Employment Survey, or ENE. This example can be found in a 2009 paper by Brun and McKenzie. The different randomization techniques are tested on a subsample of the Mexican Employment Survey. The dataset contains information from Mexican heads of households between 20 and 65 years of age. Subjects were first interviewed in the second quarter of 2002 and re-interviewed in the following four quarters. Only individuals who were employed during the baseline survey were kept. The authors simulated a treatment that aims to increase household head income, such as a training program. Covariates used for analysis are income at baseline, hours worked, female dummy, rural dummy, number of rooms in the home, self-employed dummy, and one to five employees dummy. The aim is to compare performance of alternative methods versus a single random draw for achieving balance and maximizing power. This is done by running 10,000 simulations for each method. 
By comparing the different methods, the first result we can observe relates to the improvement in balance on selected covariates. In this example, the covariate we are trying to balance is the outcome at the baseline, which is the income before treatment. One way to look at balance on a variable is to look at the average difference between the means of treatment and control for this variable. We want this magnitude to be as close to zero as possible. We can see that, in this respect, all methods perform well and similarly. Another way to measure the degree of balance is to look at the 95th percentile of the difference in means. This provides an idea of the imbalance that we find among the 5% most unfortunate, strongly imbalanced draws. Here we can see that pairwise matching and min-max t-stat present lower differences than the single random draw and the rest of the methods as well. These two methods offer better protection against imbalance in the extremes. A final way to observe balance is to look at the proportion of draws showing a significant difference in means at 10%. We can see that this proportion is exactly 10% in the single random draw method as expected for a type 1 error of 10%. However, the four alternative methods are capable of achieving better balance, in particular Pairwise matching and min-max t-stat manage to achieve balance in all 10,000 simulations for this variable. Across all three measures, pairwise matching and min-max t-stat prove to be better at achieving balance. A second important result is that the advantages that the alternative methods can provide at achieving balance disappear when the sample size increases. With a sample size of 30, we can see that the distributions for the alternative methods are more concentrated on zero, while the distribution for the single random draw, in orange, shows more dispersion. With a sample size of 100, the only two methods exhibiting considerably lower differences between means are min-max t-stat and pairwise matching. Finally, for a sample size made up of 300 units, only the min-max t-stat shows better balance than the other methods. This shows that alternative methods are only worth considering when working with the small samples. Result number three is related to the improvements on power. To test this improvement, a positive effect on income is simulated for the treated units in the database. Then, 10,000 simulations are run for each method and we observe the proportion of simulations in which we could detect the existing effect, which is power. We can see that the single random draw is the worst performing method across the board with a power of only 16%. Min-max t-stat and, especially, pairwise matching show large improvements in power. Result number four shows how the decision to control or not control for the method of randomization in the analysis stage affects the gains in power we have just discussed. As we saw in the previous slide, if the method is controlled for, pairwise matching and min-max t-stat can provide large improvements in power. However, if we choose to omit controls from the regression, the advantages of the alternative methods versus a single random draw disappear. This is why controlling for the randomization method is strongly advised in practice. The empirical results we just reviewed can be summarized in a few important conclusions. The method of randomization matters more in small sample sizes such as 30 or 100 observations. For larger samples, advantages of alternative methods versus a single random draw are diluted. It also matters more for relatively persistent outcome variables, that is, cases in which the outcome and covariates at baseline explain a big portion of follow-up outcome. This will depend on the type of outcome under study. Pairwise matching performs best in achieving balance, provided that the variables used in forming pairs have good predictive power for future outcomes. 
stratification and min-max t-stat re-randomization also improve balance over a pure random draw. Achieving better balance on relevant covariates can improve power. Controlling for the method of randomization during the analysis stage is important to preserve power gains and avoid cherry-picking results. So far, we have covered the most important topics on the implementation of an RCT study in practice. This section presents a series of recommendations focusing on how to carry out random allocation, especially in small sample settings. The first recommendation is to clearly report the method of randomization and how the randomization was carried out in practice. In particular, it is important to state which randomization method was used and why, which were the variables used for balancing, if stratification was used, how many strata were used, if re-randomization was applied, which method was used and what was the cutoff rule, how was the randomization implemented via coin toss, random number generator, etc and whether it was carried out in public or private. When deciding which variables to balance on, there are some variables which are always a good idea to consider. The first are the baseline values of the outcome of interest. In many cases, the baseline value of the outcome is the one that is most strongly correlated with the future outcome. Geographic region dummies are also worth considering since treatment implementation and shocks are likely to vary by region. Finally, variables desired for subgroup analysis must be balanced as well in order to avoid bias. Avoid over Always control for the method of randomization during analysis. Failure to control for the method of randomization results in incorrect test size and power loss. The standard rule of always controlling avoids ex post questionable decision making regarding whether to control or not. Adding controls for each method means, including covariates used in balancing when re randomizing, including dummy variables indicating strata when stratifying including dummy variables indicating pairs when using pairwise matching. Table 1, showing balance, must contain only the variables that are relevant to explain outcomes according to economic theory. The first table in an RCT-based study generally aims to show good balance across covariates. A proper Table 1 should only display balance for variables that are strongly correlated to the outcome according to economic theory. Trying to achieve balance across all characteristics is impossible and unnecessary. A table showing balance across irrelevant covariates does not add value to the study. Table 1 showing balance must be accompanied by a joint orthogonality test. Although generally seen in practice, Individual p-values for the difference in means of each variable do not mean much, as, due to type 1 errors, a few variables are always likely to show significant differences. Best practice is to run a joint orthogonality test on all the variables in Table 1 together. If the test fails to reject the null hypothesis, you have a better indicator that balance across all relevant variables has been achieved.